Dear friends, as you listen to today's service, you will also experience the sound effects caused by the famous winds of my home state. Thank you for your patience. Hopefully, the Lord will allow the grace for the distractions to fade away so that you can hear His voice speaking to your hearts. Blessings. Welcome to the International Baptist Church of Budapest for our online worship service. And today, greetings from my childhood home in Oklahoma. As you would expect, as I stand here, there are so many memories from childhood. The chicken house that was full of chickens and eggs each morning. The barn that my father and grandfather built when I was just a child. The space where pigs could be raised and in the far corner from time to time, perhaps even rabbits. There was the big open pasture for horses and cows. And then of course, my childhood home. As I'm back today in Oklahoma, my childhood home, recording this service, the world is dealing with the pandemic crisis, as is my home state of Oklahoma. People are taking precautions. People are doing what they can to be prudent. And in the midst of it, people are still worshiping God with their hearts, with their souls, in spirit and in truth. As a child growing up in Oklahoma, one of the things of my state is the red clay. And as I think of that from childhood, there's the passage that comes to mind in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul says, For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. We are going to make it through these days. And as we continue to worship God today, we lift our eyes to Him for His light, for His encouragement, for His power. Let's continue today in our time of worship. Rescue me from all my sins. 
sin and shame Amazing love that set me free I'll never be the same I humbly walk before your cross I choose to follow you I count all things I have gained Compared to knowing you For nothing compares to your love on the cross And the blood that was shed For this soul that was lost Forever I'll sing of your unfailing grace Forever I'll sing of your name O Savior of sinners, thy name is excellent, thy glory high, thy compassions unfailing, thy condescension wonderful, thy mercy tender. I bless thee for the discoveries, invitations, promises of the gospel, for in them is pardon for rebels, liberty for captives, health for the sick, salvation for the lost. I come to thee in thy beloved name of Jesus. Re-impress thy image upon my soul. Raise me above the smiles and frowns of the world 
regarding it as a light thing to be judged by men. Make thy praises be my only aim, thy word my one rule. Make me to abhor that which grieves thy Holy Spirit, to suspect consolations of a worldly nature, to shun a careless way of life, to reprove evil, to instruct with meekness those who oppose me, to be gentle and patient towards all men, to be not only a professor, but an example of the gospel, displaying in every relation, office, and condition its excellency, loveliness, and advantages. How little have I illustrated my principles and improved my privileges. How seldom I served my generation. How often have I injured and not recommended my Redeemer. How few are those blessed through me. In many things I have offended, in all come short of thy glory. Pardon my iniquity for it is great. Lead me to be a true disciple of yours. Help me to be a doer, not merely a hearer of your word. It is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Good morning. This is a reminder that God is at work in our hearts and in our lives and in our church. We have seen him supply our needs and we are trusting him for the future. I would encourage each of you to prayerfully consider what God would have you to do in terms of giving financially to the church. May God bless you and each of us as we are obedient to him. Dear friends, as you listen to today's sermon, you will also experience the sound effects caused by the famous winds of my home state. Thank you for your patience. Hopefully the Lord will allow the grace for the distractions to fade away so that you can hear His voice speaking to your hearts. Blessings. If you can today, find your Bible and look in Luke chapter 15, perhaps one of the favorite chapters in all of Luke. But building up to Luke chapter 15, we see Jesus doing remarkable things. He's helping people. He's preaching. He's releasing people from the bondages of sickness and of diseases. And he also has the habit of spending time with, quote, the wrong people. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that we didn't have to be perfect in order for God to love us? In fact, just the opposite. The Bible makes it plain that God loved us while we were still sinners. And when we come to Luke chapter 15, we see that there was a complaint as we read in Luke chapter 15, beginning with verse one. The Bible says us, tells us, now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. The tax collectors, the sinners, the wrong people were coming close to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, 
he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Now the Bible is clear. While sinners and tax collectors came to Jesus, they did not remain in their sin. They were lost and they became found as they entered into right relationship with him, as they repented and turned to him in obedience. And you and I also, we're still faced with the same thing today. We can have a right relationship with God, but that's based on repenting and turning to him. But whenever anyone does that, in any culture, in any day, there is great joy in heaven over the sinner who repents. Jesus goes on to make the point even more clear, and he gives another parable. He says, or what woman, having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now in this simple story, those silver coins, that wasn't just a small amount of money. Each coin represented a full day's work of work and wages. And so whenever this woman loses a coin, it's not a trivial thing. Likewise, by way of analogy, people are not trivial. People are of worth. And if one is separated from God, God cares because that person has worth. And God wants that person to be reunited with him. Interesting the math in this in this chapter 15. We start with 100 sheep, 99 are fine, but then one is lost. In the second story, the math has 10 silver coins. Unfortunately, we go from 10 to 1. 1% in the first story, 10% in the second story is that one coin is lost until it's found. And then Jesus goes on and shares perhaps the most beloved parable in all of the Bible. He says this, and he said, there was a man who had two sons and the younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come. 
and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. These three stories in Luke begins with 100 sheep and one is lost. It moves to 10 coins and one is lost. And at first glance in this story, there are two sons and one is lost. But as we look closer, there's even more to that story. Now we can imagine the heartache. We understand immediately what Jesus is saying. There is the younger son. He takes the inheritance far too soon. He goes to a far country. He wastes the resources that his father's given to him. And yet when he comes to his senses, he knows that he must return home to God. And each of us in our own ways, maybe not to the same extent as the story of the prodigal son, but each of us humbly, we realize God has given us abundant resources. And yet far too often, we, wa we waste those resources. We wander away symbolically, if not literally. We go into a far country. And when we come to the end of our resources, and when we face the pain and the heartache of failure, in those moments, we turn our thoughts once more where they always should have been. We turn our thoughts once more to our Heavenly Father, realizing that we need to return to Him. For many people today, that story is still, still true. Yes, the pandemic is taking place around the world, and that pandemic is causing physical, it's causing economical, it's causing emotional, and it's also causing spiritual separation. And there are people around the world today that realize in their heart of hearts that something is terribly wrong, that all of the resources that were ever given to them have been squandered and wasted, and perhaps not literally, but nonetheless spiritually and truthfully, they realize that they are in a far country and they are far away from their father who loves them. The young man in this story, he had the maturity, if you please, he had the insight, if you please, to realize, ultimately, he had the humility to realize that he needed to repent and to return to his father, and he did that. There was great rejoicing as he returned to the father, except, ironically, for the older brother. The older brother, he is not in a far country, but he is out in the field. And as he hears the sound of rejoicing, instead of coming to join the time of celebration, he comes to investigate. And with indignation, he brings charges against his younger brother. Perhaps those charges are true, but sadly, in this story, we see two sons, two sons who are both separated in their own way from their father. Yes, one had literally gone off to a far country. The other one had stayed there, but we know that this is also true. To this day, there can be people living in the same household, and yet there's a separation that everyone understands. It's cold, it's without love, and in this situation, the older brother reminds us that we must be very, very diligent about our own hearts. We must be careful when we bring judgment against others, lest we forget that we ourselves have put ourselves in a situation that we too have gone away from God. But you know, as much as we think about the lost sheep, as much as we think about the lost coin, as much as we think about the lost sons in this story, in the heart of this story, 
is the message about God. There is this man. He's sitting. We can picture that in our mind's eye. He's sitting and he can see far off into the distance. And day after day, he's waiting, he's hoping, he's longing. And then when he sees that the son is still a long way off, the father in this story got up and did something that in the time that this story was told was culturally completely against all of the norms. Instead of waiting, lording it over the son, the father in this story, when his son is still a far way off, he sees him, he feels compassion, and the father runs towards the son and embraces him. This, you see, ultimately is not just a story about a lost sheep or a lost coin or a lost son. This is a story about God and his love for his children. Any person, no matter how far they are from God, when they come to their senses and when they turn and when they start the journey back home, the Bible declares that God comes, God runs to meet that child who repents and comes back to him. In the book of James, we're also told the words in James chapter 4, in verse 6, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. The Bible tells us, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. This is a place that is my literal childhood home. And no, it's not so much the story of the prodigal son, perhaps, but there's still a similar incident, if you please, that happened in my life. Uh, after I got married, I moved far, far away from my childhood home. My grandmother was still living on this same street. And as I was living in a faraway place, I had the opportunity to come back home for Christmas one year. And as I called my grandmother, I asked her, what kind of present would she like? You know, that happens when you and I go and visit a new place. We see something interesting or unique there. We buy souvenirs, we buy presents, and we, we take them back home to our loved one. And as I was talking to my grandmother, as I was living in a new place, I was thinking of things that I could buy for her, that I could bring back to her. But as we talked on the phone, she said, son, I don't want any present for Christmas. I just want you to come on home. Can you hear God speaking to your own heart today? Whether you're far away, literally, or whether you've allowed yourselves to get away from him spiritually, the same God of Luke, the same God of our Jesus Christ stories that we read about here, the same God of then, he's the same God now. Come home. Come home to your heavenly Father who loves you. Humble yourselves. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Yes, there are stresses on every side during these times of pandemic, but may we turn and may we focus our eyes and our attention on our Heavenly Father. He is already waiting, longing, watching for us to return fully and completely to Him. May that be our story today that in the midst of all the trials, we focus our eyes on God and we come home to Him. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son 
to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one. Bring many sons to benediction today turning to the book of Hebrews chapter 12 we remember that immediately before chapter 12 is Hebrews chapter 11 and a listing of men and women who demonstrated tremendous faith with that as our background the writer says therefore since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Considered him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. As we continue during these days, let's lay aside the weights that hold us back. Let's avoid the sin that clings so closely to us. Let's also run this race of endurance, making sure that we focus our eyes on Jesus. May you go in peace and be blessed this morning.